<laughs> Get me off of this godforsaken planet. Damn it. Ah, Rampant. We meet again. But this time it's going to be a little different. Let's see, how can I make this as fun as possible? How about no water, because that means less biters. No trees either, because that means less pollution, which also means less biters. Last time it was all ice and snow, so let's make it a volcanic hellscape. And maximum cliffs, because I loathe all that is good in this world. So that's a start, but it lacks the complexity to convince me that this is really hell. There. Now it's hell. We're already on the Death World preset, which means roughly four times as many biters overall because the nests absorb half as much pollution and make twice as many biters. But let's bump that up to three times the biters per pollution. Doesn't that sound fun? To compensate, I am giving myself the small mercy of slightly raising the ore richness, because have you seen what I need to get through to get more resources? I have a feeling I'm going to be sitting on my starting patches for quite a while. Alright, now comes the process of swapping seeds until I find a map that actually looks possible with these insane presets. Believe me, half of these maps are straight up unwinnable and I'm not going to play for 10 minutes just to find that out. Eh, good enough. Now you may have noticed that things are a little dark, and that's because I'm using a clockwork mod for permanent night with maximum darkness. Also, I've turned off my minimap, but here we are. So one issue is, I turned off trees so I can't make power poles out of the wood. You start with one wood, so it's technically possible, but... <laughs> hey, if I did this using a mod, no one would complain. Let's just say that during the crash, I was able to steer next to the only pool of water around. What's that? How are there trees without any sunlight? Uh, shut up! Finally, I can start the actual run. Thanks to the Alien Biomes mod in the volcanic terrain, there's rocks frickin' everywhere. They'll be a pain later, but right now they're actually a valuable asset. I'm mostly after the huge rocks because they contain coal as well as stone. I can use the stone to make the furnaces and the coal to fuel them as well as the burner miners. The highest priority right now is just getting some iron plates going. While those work, I find as many huge rocks as I can. It's a bit tough when everything's pitch black. The biggest advantage of this is that gathering stone and coal this way creates no pollution, meaning we'll have more time until the biters come knocking. I've gotten enough iron to set up some early copper, as well as a coal snake of four miners outputting into each other so they'll continually fuel themselves. With so much stone from the rocks, I decide to make a couple bricks on the side. And using some of the copper I've collected, I make some burner lamps from the larger lamps mod. They take some of my precious coal to run, but that's already so much nicer. It's merely an illusion, but I feel safer already. The key here is speed. Rampant gives you 20 minutes of grace before things really turn up. And because it can send small attacks even without pollution, the old trick of spawning an attack wave then picking up your entire base where they just stand around confused until they despawn doesn't quite work here. Accordingly, my only chance of survival is to put my foot on the gas and not take it off until I've got flamethrowers. That's why, while my iron smelters are doing their thing, I'm already chopping down this magical wood and handcrafting hundreds of stone furnaces for future use. I want to get power production and the lab up as soon as I can. For that I'll need some water for my precious lake, and I'm investing the resources into making some more pipes so I can get it even closer to the base. The less area I need to protect, the better, and also the less I need to run, the better. I've gotten a mere 50 bricks from this furnace, but that's enough to build a short path to the coal patch and increase my walking speed significantly. Every little bit counts. With the lab and some handcrafted science, the first thing I want are gun turrets. Fending off even the first attack with just a pistol is absolutely impossible. After unlocking them, I immediately try to build four. At this stage of the game, they're still very expensive and take a long time to craft by hand, but they are indispensable. Ordinarily, I'd have a ton more burner miners set up, but already the pollution cloud is about to reach the enemy bases. And yes, the nests look a little different because this time around I'm using the rampant factions, so I can look forward to many different flavors of biter trying to kill me. Anyway, we want to transition to electric miners as soon as possible. They use less energy overall, which does conserve coal, but mainly, while the pollution output is roughly the same between the miner and the steam boiler per minute, electric miners mine twice as fast. So that's roughly double the plates for the same amount of pollution, which is, you know, good. Using the skills from my previous run-in with Rampant, after researching automation, I set up this quick factory to make us some ammunition. 
These bullets are my only shot at winning, so I've got my gun turrets protecting it with what little ammunition I started with. They're extremely vulnerable and expensive to replace right now, so I surround them with stone furnaces. They're another excellent option for early protection when you're too poor for walls. I also set up some more assemblers for pipes and gears. Just making gears like this is extremely helpful, because it lets me handcraft things, like gun turrets especially, much faster. I've only got two turrets to defend my coal, so let's hope it's enough. The nests are definitely absorbing pollution now, so we can get attacked at any second. The biters are dragging their feet a little bit, so I set up some rough automation for red science and upgrade the rest of my burners for electric miners. I'll need a bunch of electric miners and inserters to scale up, so I make some rudimentary circuit automation where I can toss in some iron and copper plates into a chest and let it output greens into another chest. And there it is, our first attack. I happened to be here, but the scariest thing about having no minimap is that there's no way to know I'm about to be attacked until the guns start shooting. Even with my help, the fighters already managed to take out one of the turrets. I've got some pipes now, which are also great as early walls, so I enshrine my turrets even more. And boy, do these attacks look scary on the map. I've already got all these enemy bases encroaching upon my tiny space here. And here they are. The pipes and furnaces did their job of drawing fire, but as you can see, these attacks are massive already. My ammo production won't be able to keep up for much longer, so I need to scale up to some proper automation. And I'll need some belts, which I can make like so. When I say scale up, what I mean is making a furnace stack. I've been handcrafting inserters this whole time to try and get one up, and it's just a matter of building it before the biters can blow it up, which I immediately fail because the moment I walk away, they start chewing on it. I don't even have any ammo, so I'm forced to run back. Alright, now to build the rest of it. And again, the moment I walk away, they start attacking it. Whatever, I can't keep replacing things. This part can stay exploded. I just need to get it up. I don't have time to automate putting coal onto the belt, so I'll put it there from some chests. With a couple more miners, the stack can start producing iron, which I'll immediately want to turn into ammunition. That's one half of what I need for defense, but to actually shoot the bullets, I need gun turrets. And those take copper plates, so I'll need to build a stack for copper as well. You need much less copper than iron in the early game, so I can make the stack much shorter. And while I was doing that, my coal defenses were clearly insufficient, and so they've blown up most of it. Without coal, I can't smelt anything, so it's a high-priority rebuild, but then my copper defenses are under attack. By the time I get there, it's only a few stragglers, but they've taken out all four turrets. Also, they've decided to start eating my most vulnerable piece of infrastructure, the water pipe that supplies my boilers and the entire base with power. I don't have the resources to defend it, I just need to get my gun turret automation up yesterday. After so many distractions, I try to work on the copper stack again, but suddenly a massive wave shows up. I try to play some extra guns while shooting them myself, but it's nowhere near enough damage because I simply don't have enough gun turrets. I die, and now they've got free reign to eat all of my precious work. Somehow I managed to fend them off after respawning, but the damage is done. I don't have the time to repair it, I just need to put down as many turrets as I can spare and try to get these things running again. These constant attacks are so difficult to deal with. Even with my base as small as it is, it never feels like I can move fast enough to avert disaster in time. The lack of a minimap really doesn't help either. Still trying to get that damn copper up, another massive wave takes out all four guns, and I can only retreat to the other four still by the copper mine. I've got to fix the water pipe again, then I walk away, and then I need to fix it again! It's impossible to build under these circumstances. Finally, I manage to get the copper stack running and automate gun turrets, but the moment I do, a swarm descends upon the least defended corner of my base and starts tearing through my mining drills. It's almost ironic, the moment I get the furnaces up and running, they take out the mines. Even my coal mine was destroyed. I have defenses automated. If I could just build up enough of a stockpile, I could recover and rebuild everything, but it's just not fast enough. Even with an assembler spitting out a gun turret every 16 seconds, I just can't make enough to replace the ones that exploded. This is why I said that speed was so important. I just couldn't get them fully automated in time. I'm stretched thin, constantly fixing the water pipe, and after going back to check on my coal mine, I realize, but only before it's too late, that it was completely destroyed and now there's a giant nest on top of it. I don't think this run is recoverable anymore. And now I must admit defeat and reload in shame. My only save is from 40 minutes ago, but that's early enough that I should have enough time to avert the terrible future that awaits alternate universe me.
The main thing I've learned is that four gun turrets simply isn't enough to defend a major target, but juggling that while also crafting all the supplies I'll need to scale up is a challenge. Also, reloading doesn't mean it's any easier this time. It's especially terrifying when they destroy my lamp. Thankfully, it just barely managed to hold, and now I'm going to apply some of that knowledge I've gained. Trying to set up a full 48 furnace stack at once was way too greedy, and way too big to defend effectively. I'm going to make a shorter one this time, and I'm also going to bring the plates towards the base instead of away. Much less of a walk, and again, easier to defend. Though it does mean actually setting up automation is going to be quite cramped with all the miners in the way. And instead of waiting for a copper stack, I'm just making the copper necessary for the turrets directly from a furnace this way. This already feels so much better. Making a half-functional stack that can easily be upgraded into the full thing is definitely the correct choice here. And with turrets at least slowly automated, I can start setting up more and more guns to try and tackle these increasingly large waves. Remember, the more we pollute, the more biters we get, and that means that they're only going to get nastier. In the middle of trying to make a copper stack, I get attacked again. And you can really see the range limitations of the gun turrets. If the biters decide to simply go somewhere else without turrets, there's not too much I can do about it. But I still need several guns just to defend one spot, so it's a constant battle between consolidating strength and maximizing coverage. Dying is becoming a very common occurrence. I don't even have any fish to eat. This time around, I'm actually keeping pace with the biters. And even though I'm getting attacked on multiple fronts at once, my base usually manages to fend them off. They blew up my water supply again, and nearby I hear some worms. I craft a flare and throw it out, and you can see how close they've already expanded to my base. I'll just need to live with it for now. Up in Colville, they've blown it up again and left a nest as a present, but it's strangely undefended, so I'm just able to gun it down and rebuild. Now I'll finally be able to automate fueling my furnaces and boilers, but I'm expecting the stretch of belts to be blown up several times. It's actually crazy how I could be minding my own business, building a belt, and then suddenly walk into an intense firefight. Their hatred for my water pipe never ends. Okay, I can't just sit around forever. I need to get some actual automation going. And that means making some green circuits. I also had to move the steam engines out of the way. But hopefully with this area defended, the water pipe will stop exploding all of the time. Obviously the next major step is automated science production, so I start setting up red science. I'll need to kill those worms over there too, and it seems that the good old wiggle trick doesn't work as well on Rampant, so it takes a couple tactical retreats to heal. With those green circuits, I can make a green science too. And this is what happened when the biters attacked the one place that was only defended with four guns. At least they didn't take out my chest of belts. Uh, so I didn't leave enough space for the green science assemblers to actually output, but I didn't want to waste the time rebuilding it, so I somehow made it work. This is probably the weirdest design I've ever made, but the finished science fits on the undergrounds between the inserters. Super compact. Now it's time for the labs, and even more defenses. Everything needs loads of guns. I can finally rip up my early automation and start mining the whole iron field. And with red and green science up, I can research grenades. They're great because they annihilate entire swarms for the price of one grenade instead of like 50 bullets. But I just want you to appreciate the experience of hearing a ton of things suddenly blowing up in the distance and needing to walk at a snail's pace while biters are ravaging your furnaces. Obviously, I need more guns. It's just a never-ending series of running from place to place fixing things that blew up. This spot next to the water is actually a really good choke point, but apparently when biters die near water and rampant, they create landfill. I'm not sure how I feel about my only source of water slowly disappearing, but I'm sure it's fine. After an hour and a half, I'm finally automating some basic amenities like assembling machines and mining drills. For now, I'm focusing on researching bullet damage instead of bullet speed, because it increases ammo efficiency. And a significant amount of my iron is dedicated to making ammunition, so the further I can stretch this patch of iron, the better. And now I'm doing the unthinkable. I've actually got enough time to set up a stone mine and start making stone bricks. The biters seem to object, but with the bricks I'll finally be able to make walls and stop defending everything with pipes and furnaces. Shoutouts to the Picker Dollies mod for allowing me to slide things around without needing to pick them up. My next major milestone is getting some steel production up. It just means baking some iron plates in a furnace again, and the stack is similar to the others except halfway down I put the plates on the outside belts. 
Since I'm routing the finished product through backwards, it means I need to make a million undergrounds through the inserters. But it works. My favorite part of this run are these permanent corpse piles around all of my turret installations. But now that we have steel, I want to research electric energy distribution so I can make medium power poles. I've nearly run out of the wood I started with making these wooden power poles, so the ones made entirely out of metal will be quite useful. And once again, showing the power of grenades. I told you this base was going to be a big mess. So during my 20 months in space, I've come up with some better ways of killing biters. And what that means is I've also got the Rampant Arsenal mod this time. That allows me to make these shotgun turrets using steel. I'm actually really excited to try these, because my instincts tell me that they'll be quite useful. And that's because gun turrets guzzle ammunition like nothing else. It's a nightmare keeping all of these things loaded, since I need to do it all manually. However, shotgun shells last longer and do more damage than bullets. So again, if I'm trying to conserve resources, these shotgun turrets seem the most economical choice. Although, they can only fire in a wide arc in front of them instead of a full circle. Forgive me if it feels like I'm skipping over a lot, like expanding the steam engines or actually making the power poles. I feel like there's more pressing matters to discuss. I'm tired of running around so much, so I decided to try and make a defensive perimeter even without flamethrowers. That didn't work out for me last video, but I didn't have shotgun turrets back then either. And for all its scary exterior, and interior, Rampant is actually helping me out here. That's because it's sending me tons and tons of tiny biters. It doesn't sound like a favor, but compared to vanilla, I'd be getting medium biters by now, which are nigh impervious to yellow ammunition. That means I can survive with the much cheaper stuff instead of needing to upgrade to piercing ammo ASAP. However, just because I'll be surrounded by a wall and a turrets doesn't mean I can rest easy. Not at all. But it seems the shotgun turrets are able to fend for themselves. They're especially great because they can strike multiple enemies with one shot. It might be obvious, but the advantage of surrounding things with a wall like this is I'll be able to build new parts of my base without needing to slap down another 10 turrets every 5 feet. If I tried doing this with gun turrets, the belt of ammunition physically couldn't move fast enough to keep everything supplied, because each turret only automatically stocks to 10 magazines with inserters, which will run out after only 10 seconds of firing, or 4 seconds if you have max level firing speed research. I've got my many grievances with the vanilla gun turrets, but hopefully these shotguns will keep me safe. You can already see the carnage piled up against the walls. It's beautiful. So many rocks. So many rocks. I don't want to go overboard with my walls, because not only is it more resources to build, but it's also more area that I'll need to run across in order to rebuild the walls when they inevitably explode. And so I'm just building this little jutted out section around the coal mine. This should be enough space for me to at least stabilize until I feel comfortable enough taking out the massive nests. The final step is to make the ammo belt circular, so it goes around and around carrying shells. Maybe this will finally give me some peace and quiet. Unlikely. The corners seem to get hammered especially hard, so I add even more turrets. There's just something about listening to dozens of shotguns going off that's deeply satisfying to the soul. It's an absolute bloodbath out here. The walls explode constantly, but as long as I occasionally run by to replace them, the turrets seem to be holding steady. Now I can finally do things like automate inserters and belts. Normally this is the kind of stuff that I get done 20 minutes into the game, not 3 hours. I'll also need to add some more power production, which means more pollution, but we can handle it right now. I said I was going to stick with yellow ammo, but I will need piercing magazines for military science, and it's nice to have some on hand, even if it's just for my personal machine gun. However, I have a specific use in mind. It might seem like I'm safe in here, but the biters are starting to evolve, and the average swarm will punch through both walls before the turrets can stop them. I've got to keep getting stronger, but I've pretty much reached the limit of what I can do in this tiny box. That's why I've got to get oil. My base is totally a mess, but it's a functional mess, and I use it to make some engine units. I'll need them to make blue science, but most importantly I'll need them to make flamethrower turrets, which I've already researched with some handcrafted military science. Only problem, the oil field nearby is covered with biters, but I've got some tricks up my sleeve, and that's these mobile chain gunners from the AAI vehicles mods. Basically, it's a gun turret on wheels, and it's a great use for all that red ammo we've got. But here we go. They're a bit stupid, but they make it work. You might not be able to see it, but I assure you that there's some oil wells under here. 
I've still got a bunch of these gunners left over, so I'm gonna go clear out all the nests around my walls. Nests always spawn a couple enemies, regardless of pollution, to wander around. And what happens is, when the nests are so close, attacking any biters causes those biters to join in as well. Did I say they're a bit stupid? They're actually extremely stupid. And with this many rocks and cliffs, sending them to drive anywhere without them getting stuck is more of a prayer than a command. I've got an entire video about struggling to wrangle AI vehicles. I'm also wary about taking out too many nests, because it massively spikes my evolution factor. The attacks are going to get way stronger now, and I'm approaching the limit of my shotgun turrets already. I need that oil up as fast as I can, but the thing about Rampant is, is that the biters will destroy anything they come across, so the power pulls necessary to turn on these pump jacks, as well as the pipe to take the oil back to my base, will constantly explode. I've got my chain gunners defending it for now, but it's not a permanent solution. To actually make it work, I'll need to build this big tube to reach it. With my pump jacks running, I'm able to start fueling some flamethrower turrets at least around the field. This oil pipe is quickly going to become the lifeline of my entire base, so I've got to make sure it's well defended. Flamethrowers are absurdly powerful, but their only weakness is that they can't fire directly in front of them and they have a bit of a delay, so a single biter that makes it in could wreak havoc. That's why I'm adding all these shotgun turrets as well. Really, getting flamethrowers around my base can't come soon enough. As expected, killing those nests really kicked up the attacks. Forget repairing, replacing entire sections of wall has become the norm. I'm not sure this base could survive another evolution, but flamethrowers are here, and so I waste no time setting them up around the perimeter. Yeah, they'll still occasionally eat through my walls, but at least they'll get roasted doing it. I've also got these searchlights from another mod to help me see biters in the dark. You're supposed to use them to buff your turrets, but I've set them to only provide light, because that's all I really need. Personally, I love the aesthetic. Also, it seems the biters have mutated into one of the factions. I've got acid biters now. I'm not sure what they do that's special, but they seem to die just fine. Anyway, I've bought myself some time, so I need to hurry up and start setting up oil refining. My only oil source is an absolutely pathetic three wells, and I'm going to end up spewing half of it at biters via flamethrower, so I'm going to be restricted to a tiny trickle of oil available to actually use. But as usual, I set it up for advanced refining ahead of time and extract some of that precious petroleum gas. First things first, I'll turn it into sulfur. Combined with the engines I've already made, we're two-thirds finished with chemical science already. Here's some random green circuits. It's always fun seeing the new and interesting ways pure desperation forces you to build. To make plastic, we'll need coal, and I'd like to point out something. It might seem safe in here, but this coal patch is my only source of power. I'm not sure if you've noticed, but there's not exactly a wealth of solar energy around here. And that means I have a definite time limit, which is something like 10 hours optimistically. The main use for those green circuits I made is for advanced circuits. Even a base as small as this one that's still running off the starter patch needs a good number of assemblers for them. Ten should be enough, and that gives us the final ingredient in chemical science. It's a major step forward to finding some sustainable solution to this predicament I've found myself in. Routing it into the labs is also fun. You may have already guessed, but the first priority is advanced oil processing. Not only is it more efficient, creating more petroleum overall out of the same amount of crude, but it's also necessary for robots. It does, however, require some chemical plants to crack the unneeded heavy and light oil into petroleum. Not many, though, so it all fits into this spaghetti mess along with the lubricant. Also, there's cliffs everywhere, so explosives are a must. And if I want robots, I'll need batteries. This really shows off all 3,000 hours of my Factorio skills. Construction bots will be another major step forwards. They start with these electric engines, using some of that lube we made earlier, as well as engines and circuits. Those can immediately be turned into robot frames, along with those batteries we just made, along with some more circuits and some steel. Finally, I can turn those into the finished construction bots. To actually use them, I'll need to make a bunch of robo-ports, which are painfully expensive for a base of this crap, but it's more than worth it for the ability to get robots to automatically rebuild and repair walls. And because I expect these to die frequently, I've got a circuit that automatically adds more whenever one blows up. Now I can finally relax a bit, knowing that I don't need to constantly keep track of the walls anymore and repairing any holes myself. Oh yeah, and I've got fast biters now. They're like regular biters, except faster. 
Imagine that. I'm free to worry about less important things, like automating cliff explosives and military science. Well, it's not really automation, it's just two assemblers fed with boxes, but don't let anyone tell you that this isn't enough. One reason I'm not fully automating it is because it's too cramped in here, but the main reason is that it doesn't matter anyway. My stone patch is almost depleted, and that means soon no more walls. And the closest patch is... all the way down here. My iron patch ain't looking too hot either. Yes, I'm safe in here for now, but in a couple more hours my iron patch will be completely dry and ammo, let alone science, will become impossible to make. I've got to work on somehow expanding to another mine, but easier said than done. Now that I've got the bots to place them, I upgrade to what's called a Dragon's Tooth design to help me defend the walls by slowing the biters down a little bit before they can reach the main wall. Or at the very least, distracting them with one bit of wall that will prevent too much splash damage. It'll lose me less walls overall, and make my limited stockpile last longer. Looking through some of the recipes from Rampant Arsenal, I came across something interesting. Regenerating walls. That sounds incredibly good, and so I start setting up some assemblers immediately. Turns out, they're exactly as good as they sound. I used the first view to surround my oil field, since it's been left without robot coverage, because including it would cause the bots to fly out of the base and die trying to reach it. With these, expanding is suddenly starting to sound a lot more feasible. I was originally planning on making modular armor and loading it with personal robots to build an expansion, but then I realized there's no solar power anywhere. There'd be no way to power my personal equipment except with portable reactors, and that takes 200 yellow science. Personal robots are way too good, so I've got no choice but to throw together some yellow science with a bunch of kludgy builds. Then there's something else that sounds great, and that's turning petroleum gas, plastic, and acid into napalm. I had been planning on switching to light oil for my flamethrowers, but this is a step above. It makes flamethrowers deal 150% damage, and I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good. With that plugged in, now it's mostly waiting around for my yellow science to appear. Getting the 200 processing units necessary to build one with a base this bad is painful, but well worth it. Compared to the start of this run, I'm just hiding away in my Cuckbox 3.0 for several hours, trying to stockpile resources until I feel up to the challenge of assaulting a million nests. Making even more regenerating walls seems great, but I also want a bunch of rocket fuel for my vehicles. One of those vehicles will be a tank, and that means I'll also want a bunch of cannon shells. The iron patch is down to 120k total ore, and the number of miners I can actually fit on it are drastically reduced. We've officially reached the point where the iron throughput is lower than the demand on plates, so this crappy little base is going to get even slower here on out. That giant patch out there beckons like the promised land. Killing this many nests is going to make them a little angry, but I've got no choice. It's time to assemble the squad, and this time, instead of trying to order them around, I'll just make them follow me in a circle. I've got flares, cliff explosives, repair capsules, grenades... Yep, I'm ready. I couldn't clear it completely before losing all my gunners and running out of shells, but it's a lot cleaner than it was. And trying to save on flares, I decided to try driving with just my headlights, only to crash into a cliff. My tank explodes and I barely managed to survive by throwing out a random slowdown capsule I happened to be carrying, and using the only healing capsules I can get, since they take wood to make. Well, that was some excitement. I can't afford to dawdle because the biters are going to recapture that area in no time, and thanks to Rampant, we'll do it with much stronger bases this time. I form up another squad and start trying to build a line of power poles. I only need a bit of power to kick things off because my plan is to unbarrel the napalm and defend the patches with flamethrowers. Well, I made it here, but remember when I said that in Rampant, the biters annihilate anything they come across? Well, guess what happened to my power poles? They've even made a nest right beside them, and just look at how much punishment they can take in comparison to the tier 1 nests. 
I only need power for like 10 seconds tops to actually unbarrel all the napalm, so I try to rebuild it, but the biters know I'm here and are constantly destroying it. They're actually attracted to my position on the map, and that's why I don't leave the walls very much. It took too long, and now my little defensive box is getting hammered. And in trying to defend it remotely, I get caught by a bunch of biters and die right outside my gates. So that's not gonna work. Instead, I'll need to do what I did with the oil and build a tube. It won't be nearly as well defended as the other one, because I simply don't have the resources. But with regenerating walls, some flamethrowers should be able to handle a couple swarms on their own. This thing won't be surrounded with pollution, so it shouldn't get hit with attacks as often as my main base. But that doesn't mean the biters are just going to let me build it. I've got a few chain gunners protect me while I work, and you can see why I wanted personal robots before attempting to build something like this. There's a bunch of nests near where I want to build, so I've got to clear them out to avoid the aforementioned infinite biter aggro. But unsurprisingly, they're none too happy about it. Blowing up nests, then retreating to my wall of flamethrowers with a million biters on my ass is giving me flashbacks. There it is, my beautiful, sweet iron patch. I've still got a bunch of biters I've got to clear off before I can totally envelop it, but it's within my grasp. Okay, these repair capsules are a little overpowered. I can just sit in my tank while the flamethrowers roast everything around me. Whenever you kill a nest in Rampant, it's like the biters go crazy and start sending attacks from all over the place. Even these tiny biters that ostensibly spawned at the beginning of the game are in on it. Also, something funny that I'd like to point out is how I'm purposefully ramming into rocks so I can collect the stone they drop and turn them into walls now that my stone mine has been totally depleted. Anyway, at last we can surround the iron patch. Not without difficulty, though, but this is a good example of how helpless flamethrower turrets can become if there's a breach. There we are, all nice and contained. Safe, mostly, from biters. Time to cover it with miners and extract that precious iron ore. To actually get it back to the base, all I can really do is run a giant belt. This is going to use up pretty much my entire stockpile of red belts too. Being excited about a single red belt of iron ore 10 hours into a run is a little painful, but we take what we can get. Actually getting it to the furnaces through my mess of a base is extra fun, but we plug it in and iron plates abound. You can see the results on the production chart. We went from 400 plates a minute and falling to 1.8k plates a minute. My starter copper patch still has some life in it, so this will be enough to keep me going for a while. But as expected, my antics have really kicked things up a notch. I am getting absolutely hammered now, and the biters are constantly trying to build nigh-invincible nests right in front of my walls. The worst things are these worms that outrange my flamethrowers. The only thing I can do is take care of them manually. And when the tube breaks, I'm forced to repair it, lest a single biter break in and eat everything. It's like I'm back in the pre-bot era. And now let me introduce you to the newest existential threat to beset my base. Yeah, so that coal mine might last, but with being able to fit less and less miners on it as it shrinks, it can no longer supply my boilers at maximum capacity. It wasn't an issue until plugging in all that iron made the base start running at 100% again. Plus all the energy costs of charging the constant stream of repair bots. I give it an extra boost by fueling the boilers with the rocket fuel I've been stockpiling, but it's not a sustainable solution. There's a fire lit under me, so immediately I start making some concrete. What's that got to do with anything? Well, centrifuges, which are painfully expensive for this base to make, but necessary. I start running a massive pipe of sulfuric acid through the tube, and I'm super lucky that this giant uranium patch just so happened to be in the path of capturing that iron mine, because now I can mine uranium also bringing it back in through the tube. But there's one problem, which is that there's no space in my base for a nuclear plant, so I've got to anger the biters even more. Okay, they are really angry now. I'm starting to think that this was a mistake. Oh god, my napalm is getting consumed faster than I can create it. Even with these crappy speed modules I put in the pump jacks, my already tiny oil field is only giving 20% of what it once did. And with only 1,000 units of napalm left, I've got to get more oil immediately. There's a field right above my tube, but I've got to fight for it before my flamethrowers run out of ammo. It's now or never.
Oh dear lord, I was so focused on killing the nests, I didn't notice all the alerts. It's all my worst fears come true. I've lost all radar contact with the tube. Everything's been torn to pieces. There's biters everywhere. It wasn't just one biter that got inside, it was an entire swarm. This is the result of only a second without flamethrowers. It's terrible. I am trying desperately to rebuild. I've got several walls and flamethrowers stocked up, so if I act fast enough, I might just be able to salvage this. I've got some crude oil left in reserve that I can use now that the system's completely drained of napalm. It looks like this just might work. But, no, no, this is way too much. There's no way, and without my new iron mine, I won't ever be able to gather the supplies necessary to try again. Ugh, it feels terrible this late in, but there's no recovering. I'm gonna need to reload. Well, at least this proves it's still a challenge. This time I'm going to just dump all the napalm and pump crude oil into the system. It does half the damage, but that's a whole lot more than zero. It's a good thing I set up my pumps to maintain 20k units of crude oil. If those tanks were empty, it's unlikely that with my oil field in the state it's in that they could even make enough to supply all the flamers. Seriously, I just want to point out that in vanilla, flamethrower ammo is never a concern. It's almost free, but rampant death world is magical. Once again, I've got to extend a tube into the wilderness and try to envelop it. The biters for once leave me mostly unmolested while I try to quickly set up this oil field and defend it. Ah, <sighs> there we go. Now it's on. But I still need to get it back to the base, and that means running more pipes. I could pump it directly into the flamethrowers, but I want to switch them back to napalm later, so it'll need its own pipe. And of course the moment I walk away, a bunch of biters break in and start eating all of them. Get out of here! Alright, we've got oil again. And just as I plug that in, the power starts fluctuating. Oh yeah, wasn't that the thing I was trying to fix in the first place? Well, it's much worse now, and I'm at risk of a powered death spiral as the underpowered miners start to mine coal slower and slower, which then makes even less power. Seriously, this low light is really spooky. You can really feel the failure. Once again, thanks to my rocket fuel stockpile, I've got some time, but it's best that I deal with this immediately. Fortunately, it doesn't matter what we burn as long as it's combustible, so with our brand new oil supply, I can turn all of that light oil into solid fuel and then mix that in with the coal on the fuel belt. It appears that my fix was none too soon. Ah, that'll keep us going for a while. Now that my walls can repair themselves, robots flying out to try and repair them just explode for no benefit, so they've lost their repair pack privileges. They'll still replace broken walls, though. After much delay, now it's time to actually do some uranium processing. And these gigantic worms growing next to my walls are a constant problem, especially in the tube. I really wish I could defend this place with robots, but I need to make a bunch of separate networks to keep the bots from flying over biters and dying. The walls seem to be holding for now, so it's a lower priority. And in case it wasn't obvious, I've switched back to napalm. Even though I have power through burning solid fuel, I still want to switch over to nuclear power. In my absence, the biters have reclaimed much of that land I cleared, and dealing with these high-tier bases is getting harder and harder. Thankfully, I've always got a wall of fire I can retreat to. That tank must have some killer AC, because I can just park in the field of burning napalm no problem. Getting attacked is so normal, I've almost completely stopped bothering to watch them die. But now I'm finally getting to expand into that area we just cleared. The bots are making it a lot easier, and since I'm bringing the ammo belt with me, these shotgun turrets can at least help out a bit from the side. These things are getting quite tough, though. After attaching it to the tube, the only thing left to do is make the ammo belt circular again. Now that we've expanded, I can deconstruct the old defensive line, which is nice because I'll be able to repurpose the walls. It's also great because I've finally managed to fully capture my starting lake, so the dying biters will stop slowly covering up with landfill from their corpses. While I was doing that, I've been making a couple efficiency modules. It won't make an incredible difference, but it will make the mines over here less stinky, and hopefully draw less attention to my thin walls out here. Unlikely, though. Alright, so nuclear power plants are really expensive, and I've just barely managed to scrounge together enough copper to make one of these things, along with all the exchangers and turbines. It feels really weird making a nuclear power plant this tiny, but 40 megawatts is all I need right now. 
I'll be crafting all the nuclear fuel by hand, because just one centrifuge is enough to give me the enriched uranium necessary. And if I stop the inserter from adding more, if there's extra steam in storage, I can save even more fuel. This will completely replace my boilers and drastically reduce my pollution production. As I mentioned before, I'm still running off my starter copper patch. It's only until you hit yellow and purple science that iron and copper demands start to even out, so it's lasted much longer. But it too is beginning to succumb to time. Luckily, there's another patch right here, and it's only a matter of clearing off all the natives. Wow, you can even stack the healing effect of these repair capsules. If you ask me, they're a little too strong, and I'd probably make the regenerating walls require power to work as well, but while I might be complaining now, I definitely wasn't when I was playing this run. Since we've already built three tubes, it's pretty easy to simply seal off the top and create a box. Stuff like this is why I'm a little keen on reducing pollution. Rampant still hates you even without tons of pollution. But even with my regenerating walls, I'm losing like 10 or 20 a minute, and without an actual stone mine, anything that reduces my wall attrition is welcome. I decide to go ahead and clear out this area as well. The biters are strong enough that chain gunners just die instantly, so it's just me and my tank. I've got hours upon hours of footage filled with nothing but carnage, so sometimes it's hard to choose what to include in the video. With those out of the way, I extend the wall some more. I wanted to envelop my old oil field because it's got tons of walls I'd like to repurpose, and it's just less that I need to worry about defending. I'm tired of any wall breach being a death sentence out here, so I'm going to go ahead and cover everything with shotgun turrets as well. It's one hell of a belt ride for those shells, but like I said, they're much more ammo efficient than gunners, so it should be enough. And the old tube to the second oil field can go away as well. This base actually looks kinda weird with this much space in it. Replacing the old tube defenses with my standard shotgun defense is a long and laborious process, but at least with the old flamethrowers behind me, it's mostly safe. So long as I remember to actually close the walls. There we go, tied into the top, and we're totally surrounded with shotguns. Once again, with only one wall to worry about, I can repurpose all the old defenses. And at long last, I can completely cover all of my defenses with robot networks. I'm barely losing any robots now, but the downside is I need to look at a million repair pack missing warnings that will never go away. With all of those walls I harvested, and after slowly upgrading all of my normal walls into regenerating ones, I decided to use a different kind of Dragon's Tooth design, just to mess with people. Nah, not really. It's because it's slightly shorter than the other design, and means one less block of range that worms can hit but my flamethrowers can't. I tell ya, you really get an appreciation for the level of carnage when you're going around the whole perimeter like this. Oh yeah, and I tore up the uranium processing, so I gotta put that back. Now I've got the space, and I've got the mines, it's time to worry about building an actual base. I'll need more power because I'm planning on using electric furnaces, so here's another power plant. It's pretty standard, and while I could barely afford the resources to make these, I've set it up so I can easily add on another two reactors when I need more power. Now about that actual base. While this might be a big iron patch, it's still only one, so I'll need to temper my ambitions a bit. I'll probably be able to squeeze about three or four red belts of ore out of it, so I'm going to build enough furnaces for two belts of plates. I'll be able to upgrade it later with beacons and blue belts if necessary, but my belt production sucks, so this is what we're starting with. And same thing for the copper mine. It's much smaller than the iron patch, so I think I'll be lucky if I get 60 ores a second out of it, but it should be enough. Like I said, copper demand is usually less than iron. Unless you're going for infinite research using space science, then it's actually greater than iron. Whatever the case, it's going to be much better than the old base, and that's what matters. I probably should have set up more steel, but I ran out of furnaces and was too lazy to gather more stone for bricks by crashing into rocks. Next I'll need to set up oil refining, and it's a pretty standard affair. I probably didn't need this many, but I have a brain condition where I can't be satisfied unless there's two rows of refineries. Then there's oil cracking. There's ratios, and it's like 17 light oil cracking plants for every 20 refineries, and only 5 for heavy oil, but I usually build half as many as the light oil for the simple reason that it makes me happy if they're the same height. After that, it's a simple matter of bringing some water from the only lake in the entire world up to the refineries. Turn on the oil, and isn't that beautiful? Almost makes you forget about the hell outside the walls. Time for plastic. Now that I'm not burning it, my starter coal patch should be enough to keep this supplied for a while. 
I regret that I had to raise the richness 33% for all the resources, but I definitely don't think I would have made it far enough to capture another patch if I hadn't. Now I'm just knocking all the oil products like sulfur and lube out of the way, since I'm trying to set up this whole base pretty fast. It's not really meant to be expandable or anything, it's just a base that can make all the science. And like any base, the most important product is circuits. I'm not really bothering to ratio things out, I'm just letting my heart guide me. And my heart tells me you usually end up spending about half of your copper on greens, so I'm making enough factories to consume a red belt of copper. My heart also tells me that each green circuit assembler can support six red circuit assemblers. And so, I don't know, I guess 20 might be enough for a base this small. It's also one green assembler for each blue assembler. Again, I'm speeding through this stuff because it's not really the point of this video. With just some engine units, I can make chemical science out of the circuits and sulfur. And since it's easy, might as well shove red science in here as well. And some green science too. Why not? We're already caught up to the science capabilities of the old base. And now I'm going straight to yellow science because it's the only one I can actually make. Don't forget, I still don't have a stone mine. We've already got the blue circuits, and there's low density structures, so we're only missing the robot frames. Those need some batteries and electric engines. This build is already hideous, but these are the things you're allowed to do when you know you're not going to be expanding the design ever. I'd like to think my designs this run have made more than a couple eyebrows raise, but my excuse is that it's hard to build when your base is constantly exploding. Like I said, I can't make it because no stone, but I'm going to go ahead and set up purple science. I always like this design that directly inserts rails into the science assemblers, since one rail assembler feeds two and they're annoying to put on belts. Then the productivity modules, which we can build, and the electric furnaces, which we can't. There, it'll be great when I can actually turn it on. And while I'm at it, might as well build military science. It also takes stone bricks, so it'll be worthless as well, but might as well knock it out fast. It's roughly one grenade assembler each, so again I like to do direct insertion for builds that I know I'm never going to bother beaconing. This run is almost looking normal. Now time to bring it all to some labs. I'm not bothering to add room for space science because I'm not planning on staying here for any longer than I can help it, but it'll let me research things with yellow science. Honestly, there's only like one useful thing I can get and that's requester chests, but hey, I've got them. I'd like to point out that this run is over 20 hours long, and the moment I had the time alone and the space to build, setting up all the sciences from scratch took me only a little over 3 hours. And that's the rampant death world difference, baby. As much as I'd love to win right now, I can't. And that's because, you know, still no stone. I crash into some rocks to collect a few because I want to make rails. This run? Actually using trains? Exciting, isn't it? The biters are strong enough to usually take out a few walls before the flamethrowers can react, and so I'm upgrading the ammo for the shotgun turrets to piercing shells now that I've got the spare resources. It'll take several hours to upgrade all the shells on that belt, but that's why I'm doing it now. So yes, I'm gonna need to capture that stone mine I pointed out a million years ago, but it's through the thickest path of nests I've tried to blow up yet. Mostly I've just been standing around watching biters get shot while I wait for these cannon shells to craft. But when I feel like I've finally got enough, it's time to rock and roll. Or, you know, tread, since these are tanks. Yeah, we can make AI chain gunners, but we can also make AI tanks. And here we go. And turns out they're actually really, really bad. I didn't even make it to any of the nests I intended to kill before the AI tanks wasted all their shells shooting random biters and friendly firing each other. Also, the biters are all strangely explosive resistant. Looks like it's back to the drawing board, I guess. Fires never let me down. How about these flame tanks? Well, I need to wait another hour or so to get all the special flamethrower ammunition they take, but let's give them a shot. Okay, okay, that is much better. Alright, biters, I'm coming for that stone. The biters themselves are strong, but these tier 1 nests and worms go down pretty easy. It wasn't my intention, but I'm starting to wonder if I actually ended up making it easier by totally saturating everything with biter nests, seeing as the ones spawned at the start are still tier 1. Maybe that's also why I haven't gotten many mutations beyond acid and fast biters. 
I have seen a brutal biter here and there, which are nigh invulnerable to bullets, but they die to fire just fine. Eh, whatever. The important thing is, I've carved a path to the stone. So in the safety of my walls, I start designing the blueprints that I'm going to use to reach it. It's a little bit too precise to design on the fly, and eventually I'm satisfied. There's a few more nests I've got to take out, and hey, the shotguns are using piercing ammo now. Alright, here we go. It's still dangerous out here, and so I'll have some more chain gunners around to escort me. Also, I'm going back to the plus-style dragon's teeth. Honestly, I just think they look better on the map, and that was my only criteria. Unfortunately, I quickly realize I'm going to run out of walls, so I'm forced to abandon it in favor of using only one wall, which is less than ideal, but I've got to reach all the way there. This is why I've been so keen on reclaiming old walls. At this point, I've barely got enough to actually reach the mines and surround them. And... ouch. That is not where you want to die. But I managed to get back in time before they can totally destroy everything. We've got a coal patch down here too, which means with this area captured, we now have a reliable supply of every resource. And there we are, stone and coal acquired. Now I've just got to set up the rails, which is straight through the old base. It's not like it's really doing anything at this point anyway, so I'm more than happy to rip it up. The coal just needs to be unloaded like so, but the stone will need a couple furnaces to make bricks. Now we actually make the mines, again using efficiency modules since this is so far away from the base and separated from any automatic repairs. I messed up and got the stone and brick belts reversed, but as soon as that's sorted out, we've got purple science and military science, as well as access to walls again. Yep, finally everything's turning up dosh. I give the new mines a hand-supplied robot network to replace any broken walls. Hopefully that should be enough. But after a while, I realize the tube's been compromised. Thankfully with the rails, I can use an extra train to reach it extra fast. It's not surprising it broke, considering it's only one layer thick, so my next priority is making more. Oh god, the fast fighter's inside! Rude. Yeah, with all those walls, I'm more than happy to add on the additional defenses that this place needed. Hey look, fire biters. They're resistant to flamethrowers, and that might have caused me some real trouble if they showed up earlier, but now that I've got shotgun turrets pretty much everywhere, it ends like you'd expect. I've done a couple things while you weren't watching, like set up a bot mall, add a bunch of cheap modules into most things, double the nuclear power plants, and add speed modules to the mines. Just some stuff. I researched artillery, and while I was expecting it to trivialize everything, as it turns out the high-tier nests are incredibly resistant to explosives, and so it takes like five or six shells to take out one. For a base this small, that's not really sustainable, but at least I'll be able to use it to snipe annoying worms. So at this point, as long as I'm determined enough, I'll be able to expand anywhere I want, and the biters, while numerous, don't have much of a chance anymore. Well, except for when I almost killed off my mining outpost by forgetting to fix the napalm pipe, but barring catastrophic user error, I'm pretty safe in here now. I considered expanding to a much larger base just to show the biters who's boss, but you know, looking around, this isn't exactly my idea of an idyllic retreat, and so I've decided to go ahead and leave, winning the game. But before I do, I see a couple technologies that catch my eye from the rampant arsenal mod like Mark III power armor and nuclear tanks. I look at the equipment grid size of those things, and I'm like, that's not balanced. And then I'm like, ooh, that's not balanced. So while I'm amassing the ingredients necessary to make those, I might as well set up all the rocket ingredients. As I'm sure you all know, we need three things to make a rocket. And we've already got the low density structures, so that leaves rocket control units and rocket fuel. They're both pretty easy to make. The RCUs just take all three types of circuits and twice as many RCU assemblers as speed module assemblers. Rocket fuel is one of the easiest recipes to craft, since you can just do an arrangement like this, and having enough light oil is rarely an issue. Research the rocket, build the silo, and there it is. Don't forget the tier 3 productivity modules. Great, now we can build that while I have some fun. This passed by in the blink of an eye for you, but this represents about four or five hours of standing around researching things and gathering resources. But boy is this nuclear tank worth it. Yes, it's just a scaled up normal tank, but hey, modders do it for free. 
The reason it's not balanced is because I can shove like 40 personal laser equipments into it. And if you want to know what that looks like, well, it looks a little something like this. Take that, biters. This is for everything you've put me through. Yeah, it's funny to me that the artillery costs like 100 steel to make even enough shells to take out one high-tier nest, but here I am driving through them with lasers that never need any ammo. Rampant Arsenal added a ton of different turrets, like cannon turrets, acid turrets, and lightning turrets, but even at the end of the run, I never ended up needing more than flamethrowers and shotguns. Really, flamethrower turrets are a little overpowered, and will always end up trivializing combat after the early game. This Rampant Revisit was interesting. I was kind of hoping that all the different biter factions would force me to diversify defenses and build more specialty designs, but while there's biters resistant to bullets and biters resistant to fire, there's no biters resistant to both, so the same designs seem to work for everything. It is a bit unfortunate that I think the total nest coverage was actually a bad thing. I'd assumed that the nests mutated as is, but it seems one spawned at the start of the game remained tier 1 common forever. However, in spite of that, hopefully you didn't think that this run was easy. I did hear about nuclear biters that can blow holes in your walls, and I'm not sure if I should feel lucky or unlucky that I never ran into them. Unfortunately, I did need to reload a few times too, so it's not a complete victory. Apparently, if you just ram through the map fast enough, you'll get into normal biters and nests that haven't had the time to transform yet. The world is full of mysteries. The regenerating walls were definitely the MVP this run. Without them, capturing new areas would have been next to impossible, and certainly impossible without a stone mine. I especially liked the darkness. It's a really fresh way to play, and maybe while I wouldn't recommend the exact settings I used this run, I think complete darkness is a really cool way to mix things up. Now I'm mostly driving out here looking for new and interesting biter mutations, but I don't think I'm going to see many beyond these sapper biters. Anyway, I've been having fun taking my sweet, sweet revenge, but I think it's time to go. And what the hell? My nearly invincible tank suddenly exploded for no reason. Looking at the footage, that number is a cluster of biters, and I think all of them spawned underneath my tank and did collision damage or something. Well, I've got a rocket with my name on it. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons, who in their boundless generosity decided to throw me into the trenches this month. It's amazing that so many people give me so much to torture myself with Factorio, but I'm out of here. I'm sure wherever this rocket takes me, it couldn't possibly be any worse than here. In a hundred years! <laughs> <laughs>